Hey everybody and welcome to another Darkest Dungeon mod overview. My name is Element5 and today we are finally getting a look at one of my absolute favorite modded classes, the Beastmaster. This class is created by Sass, Carnifex, Von Krolock, and Pikmin Biomaster with added credit going to Shay. And the Beastmaster is a druidic shaman, playing as sort of an adaptable shuffler and cloaker who brings powerful bleed synergy, support utility, ramping damage, and even creature summons your party as he dances back and forth, unleashing the power of the animal kingdom upon his enemies. And I have to sort of just take a deep breath here before diving into and really celebrating what a total success I find this class to be, as it is just an all-around top-notch project, which is a lot of fun to play and learn with beautiful animations and artwork, sounds, meaningful themes, and yet a really appropriate level of nuance and added complexity. Now, the creative development of this class endured a long evolution of phases and iterations. The original idea born out of Biomaster, who ultimately commissioned and sponsored the project, and was meant to be something far simpler than the Druid Shaman Warrior that it is today. A combination of cultural influences and ideas, including African, South American, Australian, the Beastmaster draws predominantly from Indian inspiration and that of Baba and the aesthetics and mythos of Durvasa. And while at one point this was to be a character accompanied by different animal models in combat, I'm really happy that the team continued to refine and simplify this idea down to the subtle and beautiful way in which the animal kingdom is incorporated into the final product. You really feel that the character is empowered by the strength of different animals, a process of invocation through varied markings across his body. Confidence surges as the enemy crumbles. And the final and really meaningful influence here and message behind this character is that of the horrific climate and ecological crisis that exists in our world today. The Beastmaster meant to be sort of a light way of raising awareness for the terrible loss of biodiversity our planet endures on a daily basis. And this is evident by Easter eggs found within the character and in the inclusion of real-world statistics in the character's barks, all of this culminating and coming together in a character with rich and fun mechanics, great animations, and a backstory which reads, Mukanda, the Beastmaster, is the embodiment of natural justice, the bloodstained response to disasters the land suffers because of humans who exploit it with heartless ambition. The tattooed body of the Beastmaster works as a haven for the spirits of animals and plants that have perished under corruption's yoke. The Beastmaster uses animal spirits as combat partners, unleashing them as a death sentence upon his enemies. And the class is accompanied by a gorgeous comic strip here by Von Krolock, which serves as more of a mural, a snapshot of an event, which represents the how and why the Beastmaster dedicates himself to the defense of the natural world from those who would destroy and corrupt it. And we see at the top here a group of cultists led by a virago being brutally stalked and hunted by the Beastmaster. Leaping from the shadows, the group is decimated by the Beastmaster's ambush, and the real horror sets in as he comes to discover that the flames of the camp have been fanned by the bodies of surrounding forest animals. The Beastmaster entering into sort of a communion with the spirits of the murdered animals, sharing in the sadness of their loss, as if they were his own family. And when we just sort of pan back out here, you can see sort of a before and after of the natural land dying and being taken over to corruption and decay, a snapshot of the Beastmaster's body, a haven for souls of the animals snuffed out by the corruption of man. So this really is a class that comes with a meaningful message. And for me personally, it harkens back to memories of the first time I really fell in love with the druid shaman archetypes. The ability to commune with animals in the natural world and wield their power for the greater good. So let's just take a quick snapshot here of the base stats. Max HP 21, dodge 10, no prot, speed 6. 
accuracy mod zero, crit five, and damage six to nine. So this feels both in the movement of how this moves throughout your party, as well as these stats, a little bit like a grave robber. This cloaks, it has forward movement, it has back movement, etc. And it really has that kind of dodge, max HP range, similar speed, and damage values. There's really nothing too interesting to point out here in terms of resistances other than a low stun resist, low bleed resist, and for the most part, really nothing very strong overall. Uh, and I think that is in part because this really is sort of a class without armor. It is fragile, it is agile, it cloaks. Now, I absolutely love the Beastmaster's kit. There are so many abilities here that are really interesting, fun, dynamic. And if we just kind of mouse over these, you can see that Feral Cuts is in position one or two. This is in the first three. This is all the way in the back. Then any position, first, back, and then the back three. So this is kind of all over the place. And that begins with Feral Cuts. A melee attack usable in position one or two can target any enemy in rank one to three. An accuracy base of 90, damage modifier minus 60%, crit modifier plus four. It gains plus 5% crit versus beast and de-stealths self. And then this very important piece down here called double strike, which makes this really cool. So because there are two blades, one in each hand, you essentially get to attack with this twice in a row. And you'll see that actually you can attack with it once and then have the option to attack with it a second time or go into cloak and move to the back. Continue the onslaught. Love it. Look at this. The next ability then is unwavering, usable in any position except for the back, has a cooldown of three rounds, and it awards the Beastmaster with one Aegis block. So just like the Shieldbreaker, completely absorbing an entire hit. And this is really cool. When hit, it will counter once with a 95 accuracy base, 10% damage, and two crit. So it gets a repost, but that repost is used only when the Beastmaster suffers a hit, and then it is removed. Next is Bird of Prey, usable only in rank four. This is a melee attack that moves the Beastmaster all the way to rank one, and it can target any enemy in any position except for rank one. It has an accuracy base 90, damage modifier plus 10%, plus 2% crit modifier. This will bypass stealth. It will steal stealth from an enemy that has it, and it gains 10 accuracy versus stealth, as well as 30% damage. Now we come to Cougar's Leap. A melee attack, usable in any position, can attack any enemy except for the very back rank. It is a melee attack that moves the Beastmaster forward one position. Accuracy base 85, minus 40% damage modifier, plus 2% crit modifier. And that is because it is primarily a bleed attack, uh, 3 over 2 at level 1. This, however, does gain 20% crit if you use it while stealthed. And this is the kicker down here. If you miss with this attack, it will stealth him for one round, setting you up to do it again the next round and gain that 20% crit. <laughs> next and in his kit is Ravenous, a melee attack usable in position one or two, it attacks ranks one or two, an accuracy base 95, damage modifier minus 70%, crit modifier plus eight. This is either a bleed attack on an enemy for four over two, or you can use it to consume a corpse, heal the Beastmaster 15% max HP, 
and award the Beastmaster 10% bleed amount buff for the rest of the quest. So this is a this is either a powerful bleed attack or a corpse clear self heal and ramping bleed amount buff. Now we come to one of his most interesting abilities called the Cycle of Life. Uses per battle one, only usable in the back two ranks. This will target any position. This is another corpse consumer, except that it summons a corpse bud plant. Now the corpse flower takes the place of an enemy corpse and is a friendly unit which will attack enemies. It will also immediately use proliferate if there are other enemy corpses available, summoning yet another corpse flower. Now it has a host of abilities, including Entangle, which is a stun and debuff, Thorn Snap, which will do a bleed over two, Bloom, which will give a single heal and regeneration to one of your heroes and group, or Wither, which if it dies, will AOE the enemy group for a Blight with 120% base chance. It is guaranteed to die after three rounds, in which case it will automatically use Bloom, and it cannot be targeted by other enemies. The last then in the Beastmaster's kit is Spirit of the Hunt. This ability is only usable once per battle and cannot be used in position one. This will buff a friendly target for 10% damage, and then when that target kills an enemy in combat, will then heal them for 20% of their max HP and give them a minus eight stress heal at level one. Check this out, let's try this again. So now when that gets a kill, it should heal itself. Five to eight. Be gone, fiend. How awesome is that? Okay, so now that we have gone over every one of these abilities, let's just talk about how to play this and how to kit it. There's a lot to consider here. Now, what I love about this class is each of these abilities on the surface are not that difficult to understand. There is just not a lot of meat in the description here. It is fairly straightforward, but optimally playing with this class is not the easiest thing in the world, and that is because you have so many options. There's so many different things you can do. This is a druid, after all, and you can kind of mix and match and switch it up depending on where you're going and how things are moving through the dungeon. But let's just start with a very basic ability here, which is a really, really good opener, and especially if you get to the veteran game where cloaked enemies start to really appear, which is Bird of Prey. So that's gonna seat you starting in the back, kind of like a grave robber using lunge, right? You start in position four, you have high speed with speed six, so you're likely to open up, target something that's stealthed, even steal stealth from them, and it has a great range because you can hit everything except from the first rank. Assuming you open with bird of prey, that leaves you then in position one. You have a lot of options once you're in position one. The only thing you're not gonna be able to do is Cycle of Life and Spirit of the Hunt. So something like this then is a very straightforward build, which would start you in the back, moving to position one, in which case you can use Feral Cuts and then attack once and stealth yourself to the way back. The next round you are stealthed, so you could open up with Cougar's Leap, grant that 20% crit bonus because it is stealthed. Uh, or if you're about to take a bunch of damage, maybe there's a, a, a group of brigands and they're going to AOA your group, a powerful boss, and you're you're definitely, you're destined to take a massive hit, well then definitely use Unwavering, gain that block, have a nice powerful repost. just be mindful of the fact that it has three round cooldown. So let's just talk about Ravenous for a second, okay? 
Ravenous, as you might recall, can only be used in position one or two. It is either a bleed of four over two, which feels a little bit like the noxious blast here of a Plague Doctor, or down on the bottom half here, you can consume a corpse, heal self, and get that 10% bleed amount per quest. So that buff just lasting through camping and through the entirety of your quest. Why is that important? Well, let's say you're taking on a boss in a medium dungeon that is vulnerable to bleeds. This would be an excellent way to get early kills in and then consume those corpses and start to ramp up the bleed output that you're ultimately gonna wanna stack on whatever boss that you're fighting at the end of the dungeon. We really should not overlook the value of Spirit of the Hunt here. I also appreciate that this is uses per battle one because this is powerful. I mean, you're just gonna outright buff another member of the party for 10% damage, but it is a great way to sort of end combat and just give somebody the ability to just get a killing blow and then heal them and de-stress them before you get out of there. It's really important to note though that because of the, the way the mechanics in this game work, if you only have one enemy left and you put this on a hero and that hero gets the killing blow of the last enemy of the group, it will not tick and get that healing buff. So you want to think about utilizing this on somebody before you're down to the last enemy left. So last but not least, Let's talk about Cycle of Life. The notion that you are summoning a corpse flower in the position of an enemy corpse and that it is now a living entity working for your team. As I often say, Darkest Dungeon is a game about control. And one aspect of that is thinking about action economy and opportunity cost, okay? So you, the first thing you have to consider is the fact that this ability is only usable in position three or four. You can only use it once for combat. So right off the bat, you're limited from being in the front line and using a bunch of these different abilities. The best time to get this off would probably be to land a killing blow with feral cuts, hope it doesn't crit so that a corpse remains, then stealth come all the way to the back line and next round summon something out of that corpse and get a corpse flower going. Now, the other aspect of this is you are you are only allowed to have four abilities on your bar at any time. So 25% of your kit's real estate is dedicated to an ability that can only be used in the back line and can only be used if a corpse is available. Certainly, if you can get a corpse to appear in the first couple rounds and then summon this, say round two, this is gonna be really beneficial and it's gonna start to just gain momentum as you can now be attacking while it's attacking on its own. However, in most cases, the battle might already be decided by the time you have corpses and are in position to use this anyway, in which case it might not even be that worth it to cast Cycle of Life and instead just attack with another Cougar's Leap or consume that corpse with Ravenous and give yourself a heal and a bleed amount for the rest of the quest. But just a, a couple more important notes about this class. The crit buff that it gets is actually to bleed the enemy that it crit for one over two, as well as buff self for crit versus bleeding. The Beastmaster does not have a normal move ability. It will actually cloak him and set him up in the back rank. It's also important to note that this cannot visit disease treatment in the sanitarium or visit the gambling hall and transept. So in order to remove diseases from itself, you need to be looting with this character in the dungeon and finding some of its own unique items, which will help cleanse things from different characters and, and from people in your group, or using its camping utility to remove d diseases from self or the group as well. It also cannot develop quirks, which are negative versus beasts or in the wield. It cannot be partied with other beast masters, and it uses the outsider's bonfire district. Now, in terms of its camping utility, it has five unique camping abilities here, which is sort of rare for a modded class. And that starts with shamanism and is also why it was important for us to mention that this cannot visit disease treatment in the sanitarium here. Shamanism is a time cost for self only search for herbs, remove disease from self and has a coin flip chance to remove disease from the rest of the group. So this is obviously one of the only ways to remove disease from this class. And I'm very happy to see that this is a time cost four. It is expensive and it should be because that gamble to remove diseases from the rest of the group is very powerful. It does feel like a gamble. Getting herbs is not that powerful, but removing disease is quite useful. So next then is totemic guidance. In another expensive time cost five, 
This is his Prevent Nighttime Ambush. It also grants minus 10% chance that the party will be surprised. And it produces a totem. Now, the totems that it gets are consumable items which depend on which dungeon you're camping in. So given that we use this during a camp in the Warrens, we actually get a totem which will grant us a 20% damage versus beast for the next four battles. So very, very cool. It should be, again, another expensive time cost five because Prevent Nighttime Ambush is very valuable. But then that production of a totem is really, really useful too, making this probably one of the better Prevent Nighttime Ambushes that you can bring along. So next then is Big Game Hunt. Another time cost four. The entire party gets 20% bleed amount applied for the next four battles and 20% damage versus size two. So the name and time cost should tell you that this is a super powerful utility before you go against a boss that is vulnerable to bleed, right? Everybody, so you think about taking this in the Crimson Court, any any boss in the, in the Warrens, for example, use this as a camp right before you go into that fight, get that damage bonus versus size two, and just stack on huge bleed amounts. So that brings us to Prey Stalker, a time cost three, self only 10% chance monster surprised, 10 accuracy on the first round and 10 accuracy while stealthed. So I actually really like this idea. I think this is a great buff if you're early in a dungeon and you really wanna get the jump on enemies on the way to your boss or on the way to the end of the dungeon here, right? If this is a game about control, then you care very much about chance of monsters being surprised, giving your team the opening hit before they even act, and you care very much about accuracy, especially on the first round where you wanna make sure you land that stun or that killing blow or that crit, etc. So again, this only buffing self, but I love the idea that you are stalking your prey and getting the opening. And finally, wildlife expertise, a time cost to self only 5% scouting chance for the next four battles. This will also search for herbs and for some extra food and you can use this twice a camp. And I really like that because at time cost four, to get 10% scouting makes sense to me as well as herbs and food, but because you get multiple uses, you have multiple die rolls that you're actually going to get more provisions. Now in terms of trinketing the Beastmaster, you know, it should be pretty clear that this is a melee class. I mean, every one of these abilities that it's doing, even Bird of Prey is a melee attack and it has a lot of bleed synergy, some self-heal, okay? And it is not the most survivable class. It feels a little bit like a rogue. So taking all that into consideration, I'm thinking about melee accuracy. I'm thinking about damage versus beast. The damage versus beast here, capitalizing on the crit versus beast of feral cuts, which can be kind of nice. Anything that is going to improve your bleed output. Of course, we always talk about the recovery charm because it is so valuable, and that is worth talking about in consideration of Ravenous, because you can consume corpses to heal yourself, and that can be kind of useful. Uh, but ultimately, you know, this class has a whole list of its own trinkets, including that for the Color of Madness DLC, as well as Sunward Isles standalone dungeon mod. So we have the King of the Rivers here, the Beastmaster only for Sunward, when hit if below 50% max HP, will self-cure and get a restoration, but has an internal cooldown of two rounds. Then also a whole host here, if you wanna just pause the video and check out some of these other really great Animal Kingdom themed trinkets, including Mukanda's head from, ostensibly from the collector, a very rare five speed, seven crit, and 15% damage while stealthed at the cost of 20 stress. And I'd love to hear in the comments below what you think about this class and what you think its most powerful ability is and why. And I'll make sure to have a link to download this below the video. And remember that as long as you're playing on PC, it is quite easy to install mods through the Steam Workshop. All you have to do is head over there, find the mod you're looking for, make sure you subscribe to the mod and then boot the game and then head over here on the side of your save file to your mod selector and then make sure that you click in the one that you want. Make sure you pay attention to on the Steam page if any of them require your mod to be loaded in a specific order. Special thanks to the team behind this mod for putting together something that I think is absolutely amazing, is super fun to play, and for all the help behind the scenes with this video. Thank you guys very much for watching. Make sure to subscribe to the channel for more modded content and everything else Darkest Dungeon. Join us on Discord as we will see all kinds of previews of mods like this one here in the coming months, and we are in the middle of our current Crimson Class Design Contest 
And don't forget to join us on Twitch as we are still in the early stages of our modded only Blood Moon playthrough, showcasing all kinds of classes just like this one, custom enemies, boss fights, having a grand old time. We would love to see you there. Thanks everybody. See you next time.